I actually have the sword. Oh my god! I have the sword. That's, a, that's the real one? This is a big year because, and I'm sure you're aware, but this is the 30th anniversary of Hook. Can you believe it's been 30 years? No, I cannot believe it's been that long. It, now that you mentioned, I did not really realize that till we started this this interview. Um, that's amazing. It's a, it seems like the last time we really talked about in depth was the 25th anniversary, which is now obviously five years ago, which feels like it went by in a blink of an eye. I was watching it last night, and it feels it, it's it's interesting watching it as an adult now because it almost feels like more powerful to me now as an adult. When is the last time you watched it in its entirety, and does it hit you in different ways over time the more you watch it? Last time I remember watching it in its entirety was not too long ago where I reconnected with J.V. Hart, who's the executive, you know, one of the executive producers and the writer of the original script of Hook. And so we watched it um, at the Austin Film Festival and I got to watch it in a movie theater and it was really so magical to kind of see in a in a theater on the big screen with a packed audience. In it. And of course, you know, now in my 40s watching it definitely hits definitely different as as an as an adult i mean one of the things that first i realized is i'm probably you know right around the age of, of where robin was when robin did the film which is a lot you know it just has a different vibe to it and and we lost robin of course so rest in peace robin and then just what it means that as an adult like to never grow up to really you know try to keep the the kid the, the energy and the the hope of, of, of the, the child in us alive, uh, even as we kind of progress. Uh, I've been in the industry now for you know, over 35 years. And um, when I go back and watch films, it, it definitely feels like you're, you're kind of like looking through old, you know, albums of, of friends that are friends that you've lost, friends you owe, you owe phone calls to, friends you miss, and, and seeing us at certain, you know, teenage me and Jimmy Matteo at 15 and, and we're still friends today. It's pretty, just all these kind of things go through your mind. What's the number one question you would say you get in regards to Hook and Rufio? Always, what was it like working with Robin Williams? Robin comes up all the time and, and, and rightfully so because he's just a magical person. You know, the short answer is always like, hey man, Robin is the genie. You know, he, he played the genie in Aladdin and he is the genie when you're around Robin Williams He's so smart and so fast and so funny and so kind and 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 magic can happen and often does. So that's, I mean, in a nutshell, that's Robin Williams. But just beyond that, I got to spend so much time with him. He was so, such a loving and caring actor and mentor for me during that time in my life. And we talked a lot about poetry because even going into the film, I was a big fan of, of, of who he was in his career. Of course, from the Mork and Mindy days, growing up watching that. But then watching his films like uh, The World According to Garp was a really heavy film for me. And then, of course, Dead Poet Society, where then I, after working with him and talking about all this poetry, continued to love poetry, started writing poetry, and then ultimately created a poetry venue in my living room, which became DPL, the Poetry Lounge here in Los Angeles, originally Dante's Poetry Lounge, and uh, which is now 20 years later, 20 plus years later, uh, you know, became the inspiration, which became Death Poetry Jam on HBO, which went to Broadway and won a Tony. And Robin Williams' spirit is a part of all that. And now it's DPL here in Los Angeles is still the uh, the largest weekly open mic in the country. Do you have a favorite, like, scene or moment from set that you shared with him? There's so many. I mean, there's so many things I would just, I literally would come to set to watch him and Dustin and Steven work on my days off just to, like, be around greatness. I mean, when you're when you're an artist or you do whatever you're doing out there, it's like when you're around greatness, you hope that you have the wherewithal to understand what's going on and and, and have the you know just the the good sense to sit down and and watch it and see it. And a lot of time, I I talk to young artists and I and I'll kind of just compare it to being able to watch you know Picasso paint a stroke or Mozart conduct a symphony. That's what it was like going to set every day. Working with these guys and then taking the time off when you don't have to be on, under the pressure of acting, you can kind of just sit and it's acting class, it's director class. It's Steven looking at you, explaining how he's putting the scene together. Dustin being Captain Hook and seeing the, the mastery of work he's doing and, and just kind of being in the, 
in the presence of Robin Williams that he's just kind of does his thing, goes off and just does the magic of Robin Williams. I mean, those guys were wonderful. And as a young actor at 15, and quite a serious actor, you know, I'd go to the sets every day watching Hoffman films and asking questions about Lenny and about Midnight Cowboy and about Kramer vs. Kramer and read his biographies and ask this and that about books. And and I, I had a great relationship with him as, as, as one of my heroes. And of course, with Robin, he just had a way of kind of bringing you in and just kind of welcoming me, me into into Hollywood, really. I was a young kid coming into to the world and a lot of times you feel you're on the outside looking in. One day Robin kind of pulled me aside. And he was he was like, Dante, like where are you from? And I was explaining to him, I'm you know, I'm from the Bay Area. He was like, Oh yeah, me too. I was like, Oh yeah, of course. Everyone knows everyone Robin, everyone knows you're from San Francisco. Like you're a legendary <laughs> San Francisco cat. And he goes, no, but where's your family from originally? And he's like, I'm all, I'm like, oh, I'm Filipino. And he goes, oh, I, I thought so. His wife at the time, Marsha, she's like, my wife's half Filipino. And like, you totally remind me of my, my father-in-law. And he starts talking about that and the culture and the family. And he just had that way of, you know, you feel like you're an outsider looking in a lot when you're in Hollywood at the, you know, mm -hmm. there's all these big movie stars at the big party. And even being on the set in the movie with them, you still feel like they're in their own little world. And he had a way of like kind of putting his arm around me and going like, no, nah, man, like you're welcome. This is for you. And I'll never for yeah. forget him for that. That's incredible. I One of my favorite things about this movie too is like you talk about the talent that you was like obviously on set, like Robin Williams and Spielberg and Dustin Hoffman, but there were so many like really famous cameos in this movie that a lot of people don't even realize. Wild, are there. wild, wild. There's so many crazy cameos in Hook and um, it was something new to learn every day. Some, People came on set, uh, Phil Collins, which I went to set to go see him because of course is in 91 and Phil Collins is one of the biggest singers in the world at the time and was a very lovely guy. Glenn Close, which a lot of people miss, who's in the Boo Box. And of course, another big Glenn Close fan. I was, I remember having a, a very interesting conversation with her because I'm, I'm a kid and I was talking to her about a Fatal Attraction and she just looked at me like, oh, you like Fatal Attraction? And I was like, oh my God, I love <laughs> that movie. You've seen that? <laughs> Have you seen that? It was that kind of conversation. But I loved her in that film. She was so scary and sexy at the same time. And she's just an amazing actress. Uh, there's David Cosby from Cosby, Stills, and Nash. Was one of the pirates and he would be on the set a lot and talking to him about folk music and just vibing out with him. He was such a sweet, sweet guy. Um, so there's th these things were happening. On top of that, there was a uh, just people came to visit the set every day. We had so many guests that came to the set, they all signed the guest book of Hook. And at the end of the, the shoot, as one of our rap presents, they gave us all the guest book of who came to the set of Hook, which is everyone in Hollywood from Robert De Niro to Prince to Michael Jackson to what? Liza Minnelli to George Lucas to, I mean, every day you came to set, there's so, I mean, not only did people just want to come see these sets and see the magic, but we're all fans of Peter Pan. Peter Pan's not like a, a, an IP, an intellectual property or a franchise. Peter Pan's a, a fairy tale that we've all kind of been a part of. And so everyone came to the set to, to see these people work. I mean, Maggie Smith playing Grandma Wendy, Bob Hoskins. So working with all these guys and people doing, you know, the cameo parts, people doing one, one day parts, but all of the, just so many amazing actors working on the film. It was it was really just a, you know, it's crazy to even think about now. You're talking about stuff that's in front of you, around you. Uh, do you have hook prized possessions? Oh yeah, let me see. Around? I have some things. Let me see what I can pick up. I, that last yeah, thing I just told you, I, I finally see where's that. Supermarket sweep for hook stuff. <laughs> okay, Ash, we got some things. There's some stuff that All people right. don't, don't really get to see. There are things like there's my. I have my Rufio toy, which is cr like people see that. I signed these at Comic Cons. Rufio, which is amazing to have your own toy at 15, was pretty fun. One thing I show people, but kind of like a very deep cut, is I actually have the sword. Oh my God. I have the sword. That's, not, that's the real one? That's the real one. This is the real sword. So. I did a lot of sword training on the set. I think I trained two or three months before we started shooting and then every day throughout the filming. So I'm very proud to say that all the all the sword work you see of Rufio is me doing all the sword work at 15. And I, I'm, a, I'm a dancer and I was a dancer before that. So a lot of the choreography is dance. So I really took to 
the sword play. So I'm very proud of all the sword play. Um, but I came, I, you know, even though when I lost the sword to Pan, when I handed him the sword, I still became very attached to that sword. Um, and if you look at the tip of this sword, it's like, it's kind of like graveled out. That's the sword that we used when I did the cross, the, the, when I made the line in the sand. Yeah. That's the sword we used. So that, it wound up in my trailer and it was there for so long. It just went, I don't know. It's been 30 years. I think the statute of limitation is over. It's uh, yours. It's yeah. Good, yeah. <laughs> this is a nice piece that we got from, from set when we, uh, Steven Spielberg for the Lost Boys and Girls. See, he, it's our guest book. So it has these pictures from, from the film, which is amazing. Pictures that are just wonderful from the film. Hoskins, all the characters, all the great characters. But then what is also great is you see the guest list of the people that came in, um, came to the set. And it's like, it's really great. Demi Moore. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, rattle, Glenn, up, rattle off a couple of names. Glenn Close. I mean, Kate Capshaw, Billy Crystal, Penny Marshall. Rest in peace, Penny Marshall. Whoopi Goldberg, Twiggy, Warren Beatty, Holly Hunter. This is the guest that just came by. It's... It's a uh, Quincy Jones. God, so many, so many people. When you watch the film, I remember because I was on set one day, and George Lucas was there, and Carrie Fisher, and of course, it's, you know, I'm a Star Wars fan, so it's not lost on me. Like, oh, it's Star Wars. Uh, I have a Star Wars tattoo, the, so you're speaking my language. <laughs> so, and of course, George and George Lucas and Steven Spielberg are really good friends. But that when when Tinkerbell is taking Peter to Neverland the first time, there's sprinkle, there's a little like pixie dust gets sprinkled on a couple, and they float in the England, in the London kind of uh, skyline. That's George Lucas and Carrie Fisher kissing. That's, yes. I remember that. Yeah. I remember. I just, I, was found, like, oh. I just found this out like yesterday. <laughs> oh, really? That was them. And I yeah. remember being on the set that day going, oh, that's like, oh, that's Princess Leia. He's kissing Princess Leia. What's going on? <laughs> and then the last thing I'll show <laughs> you, so which is a personal gift. And like I told you, uh, Dead Post Society is one of my favorite films. And so my rap present from Robin Williams was Leaves of Grass, this book, Walt Whitman book that they talk about in Dead Poet Society. And he inscribed it for me. And so it's really one of my prized possessions because I love the movie so much. And I love Robin and I love poetry. And he's just an amazing, amazing person. And this is like, was an amazing gift from him. So this, uh, I yeah, keep some memorabilia around. This is, a, this, I think this is a tough one. If you could revisit any character you've played, maybe it's Zuko, maybe it's Rufio, maybe it's somebody else. Who would you want to revisit and what would you want to do? Hmm, good question. I mean, look, Ruf, Zuko's probably my, one of my favorite characters, but we, I did him for so many years and we we did we got a lot out of him. And I love all the relationships I made during that time in my life. And I'm still close to a lot of those people. I think Rufio, we got to go back to because I was so young. You're 15. We're around literally the, the gods of the industry. And I did do my best to kind of be present. But to go back and, and, you know, one more moment to like in a working condition to talk to some of these people. Some have passed away and to spend time with them, to, to get to to get another piece of gold from them. They they all gave me a lot of gold growing up, but to go back and, and try to like get a little more gold and, and to know the things I know now as an adult and to go back there would be would be fun to kind of hang out in that world just for another day be cool. I wear my heroes on my sleeve, I always have, and I still do to a degree, but um, really finding your own voice and, and who you are, that's really the, the, the best advice I've, I've gotten and I try to give to the next you know, generation of artists that I come across. It's like, at the end of the day, we're all, we're all a million to one shot at best coming to this town to try to do our thing here. Whether you're, you know, whether you're black, white, Asian, Latino, male, female, trans, gay, straight, we're a million to one shot at best, uh, which is horrible. Could be, it could be 10, 10 million to one, but the only shot you got really is you. So if you don't have the courage to kind of show who you are, you ain't even got a, you ain't even got a chance. So mm -hmm. have the courage to, to find your voice and be you, do you.